Happy 40th, NSGC. It is with great pride that I say, I am a genetic counselor. I will be talking about our past. Yes, I am representing the 5% of our membership that is represented by dashes on the professional status survey. We are so few in number that our salaries are identifiable. We are the generation that when we began practicing uh, and answering questions, you do what? Your genetic counselor what? You probably still hear this sometimes, but not as often. We were not consistently called genetic counselors. 23% were still using the title of genetic associate in 1984. Generally, clinical geneticists considered themselves genetic counselors and thought those with master's degrees should be genetic associates. According to Joan Marks, early director of the genetic counseling program at Sarah Lawrence College, there were many leaders in the medical community who felt strongly that the most appropriate candidates for training as counselors should be mature women <laughs> who were parents as well. There was serious doubt that non-physician counselors could be trusted to know their limitations. There was open skepticism that dealing with the emotional component of genetic disease was either necessary or constructive. Clearly, all of this was disproven. What did clinical practice look like? Our generation began practicing when computers were either non-existent or newly in use. There were no fax machines, cell phones, or internet. For case prep, we used books. <laughs> when needed, we walked to libraries, both ways in the snow, <laughs> and used a card catalog to find journals. We had to figure out and define our roles for ourselves, for the physicians we worked with, and our patients. In the early years, mostly we took family histories and we drew pedigrees with our plastic templates of circles and squares which we carried everywhere. We did inheritance and psychosocial counseling. Clinic visits were often an hour or more. Genetic testing, mostly we replied, not available. <laughs> the upside, we didn't have to deal with insurance issues. <laughs> In terms of finding genetic testing labs, mostly we ordered karyotypes and single gene tests became more available in the 1990s. We found labs because some had, you know, were well established, but others we literally would call the authors of journal articles and ask, you know, and find testing that way. Then in 1991, NSGC published a list of labs in Prospectus, which became a key resource. Generally, we worked with clinical geneticists, and we were mostly working in pediatric or prenatal genetics clinics. We were not viewed as autonomous service providers. How did we advance our roles? By demonstrating our knowledge, value, and asking to do more. With humor, but meaning every single word, I had a 50% rule. If the doctor talked for more than 50% of the clinic visit, I would not write the letter. <laughs> I had to remind them of that a couple of times, um, but over, over time, um, my role increased and so did the letters I had to write. <laughs> NSGC provided us with a community of genetic counselors and also facilitated our professional development. We shared our successes and our challenges with each other. Through our meetings, our networking, and our conferences and, and uh, publications, we learned what other genetic counselors were doing and were inspired to take on new roles and expand into new areas like cancer genetics. How did NSGC start? Well, you've just heard um, from President Audrey Heimler, and I also encourage you to read her article in the Journal of Genetic Counseling. 
Of note, Sarah Lawrence College played a major leadership role, including their students, in launching these discussions nationally. There was heated debate on whether to form a society, what the name of the society should be, defining the profession, the professional membership criteria, and national representation. When NSGC started in 1979, there were 233 members. Membership dues, $20. For students, five. Number of jobs listed in our newsletter, Perspectives in Genetic Counseling, four. The first, the first professional status survey was conducted in 1980. Median salary for new graduates, $16,000. And if you had five years of experience, 18,700. The first NSGC conference was held in San Diego in 1981 with 182 attendees. Six years later, I attended my first NSGC meeting uh, as a second year student at the University of Michigan. And University of Michigan is also celebrating 40 years. Go blue. <laughs> my whole class came to the meeting and we all roomed together, all two of us. <laughs> NSGC meetings were held with the March of Dimes until 1985 and with the American Society of Human Genetics until 1999. This meant you were gone an entire week if you attended both meetings. To call work or home, you waited in a long line to use the payphone. We didn't have to make plans in advance to meet up with anyone. We were all in the same meeting room, uh, not as large as this by any means, uh, same small hotel room, and we all stayed at the same hotel. There were few exhibitors at our meetings, and most were cardboard stand-ups. You made sure to get to the exhibitors early so that you could get brochures on as many different genetic conditions as possible. Clinics had limited budgets, and so copying these brochures was how we provided resources to our patients. You volunteered for NSGC because you were NSGC, and that was the only way conferences, publications, and resources could happen. The Journal of Genetic Counseling was launched in 1992, and that facilitated and enhanced our field's recognition. The listserv was launched in 1997, and due to our newness of using this technology, uh, we sometimes sent personal messages to the entire listserv. <laughs> 20 years ago, I served as president of NSGC. Genetic testing was a key policy issue, still is today. I had the honor of representing NSGC when President Clinton issued an executive order banning genetic discrimination in the federal workplace, and also represented NSGC at the White House ceremony when the draft of the human genome was announced. Back when I had to answer the question, you are a genetic what? I would not have uh, anticipated ever in, uh, representing NSGC in the presence of the President of the United States. Let's talk about boards. The American Board of Genetic Counseling was established in 1993. Prior to that time, clinical geneticists and genetic counselors took the same boards. That's right, you actually sat next to the geneticists that authored the chapters you studied from and were the luminaries in the field. You traveled to one of the few cities where boards were offered with your sharpened number two pencils to fill in the dots on the paper exam. The boards were offered every three years in June, and you waited until October, usually timed with the meetings, to get your scores. A list of those who passed was published in the American Journal of Human Genetics, and you wanted to be on that list. <laughs> you found out about jobs from your program director, the single job board at NSGC, and perspectives. In other words, few jobs existed. Therefore, you would send your resume to every genetics clinic in the city where you hoped to live. I graduated in 1987 after getting married between my two summer rotations, thinking it was a good idea to continue living with my husband. I needed a job in Michigan. 
there were no genetic counselor jobs in Michigan. And so I continued working in the cytogenetics lab, which I'd been working in prior to and during grad school, analyzing chromosomes. Four months later, a prenatal job became available, 90 miles round trip and commuting every day from Ann Arbor to Detroit. I took it. Like other genetic counselors of my generation, I was just pleased to have found and grateful to found a job in, as a genetic counselor. And so 32 years later, I am the generation of dashes in the, in the professional status survey, the generation that saw the launch and early days of NSGC. NSGC became our professional home and community. While I have talked about the past, I'm very present in the present and look forward to an amazing future for our profession. Thank you.